I think in keeping with tradition, I should start with, good morning, church. All right. <laughs> I am honored to be able to speak to you today. I wanted to start off by sharing a little bit about me first, um, giving some context to who I am. Um, my wife, Emily, and I, like Dennis said, started coming here in December of last year. Uh, and excited enough, our family is growing by one in September. Uh, we're going to welcome our firstborn son, Theodore. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, for me, I, I began my relationship with the Lord the summer before my senior year in 2008, 15 years ago, which whew, doesn't feel like that long. At that time in my life, uh, like a lot of teenagers, I had no hope. I had no idea what my future was going to look like. I was engaging in some really bad behaviors. I was making some decisions that, uh, that were not great. And um, the summer of my senior year at football camp, I met a man who changed my life forever. He, uh, he went up to me and I was jogging onto the field and uh, he looked at me and said, why are you wearing that necklace? And I was wearing a cross necklace for no other reason other than I thought it looked cool. Uh, I didn't have a really good explanation. And he, uh, he asked me that question and I didn't have a good answer because no one ever asked me. So I just pointed at it and then pointed up. And it may not sound like much, but that moment led to a relationship and a, a, a growth to where I went from being the person making really horrible decisions to within weeks later, carrying my Bible to school, praying and leading team meetings uh, in prayer. And I was actually encouraging my teammates to come to Bible study on Fridays before games. And it, this may not sound like a big, it sounds, it sounds great, but if, if you knew me during that time, anybody who, kn who knew me as a, as a high schooler, um, this was a very scandalous oversells it, but it was crazy. It didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense that this, this boy who was, was wild and crazy and doing stuff is now trying to lead people to the Lord, and it was, it was amazing. And I began this journey in that time. And I was so zealous and so excited. Uh, I was baptized a few months later uh, when I learned how, how valuable baptism was. And the funny thing about it, a little funny story with that, the, the, the group I was attending on Saturdays, um, we were going to get baptized at this church in Urbana. And I show up, and it turns out the baptismal is broken. And you would think that would deter me, and it didn't. Because I quickly asked, well, does anybody know anybody in the area that has like a jacuzzi tub? It was too cold to, uh, to do it outside. And someone in the group actually had a family member nearby that had a large jacuzzi tub. And I said, that'll work. So I got baptized in the bathtub because I didn't care what it looked like on the outside. I cared about what it meant. It, I cared about what it meant. This, this symbolism of dying with Christ and being raised again with him. That's what I cared about. And throughout this journey over the last 15 years, there's been a lot of ups and downs, as I'm sure anybody who's walked with the Lord can, can agree with. Um, a big, a big turning point in my life with the Lord actually was when I met my wife. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, it, it became walking in step with somebody, not just by myself. And um, even meeting her, as I get into my message today, how I met her was a testament to God's grace in my life um, because I wasn't trying to find her. I had tried forever. And in the moment when I finally gave up is when I found her. And so even the way I met my wife was was, is a testament to God's grace in my life. And we've been married for almost eight years now in September. And about a couple years into our marriage, and if, if you were here about a month ago when I shared a testimony on finances, how, the God, how God moved in our life, I kind of went into depth a little bit about this season that my wife and I went into, and it was rough. It was, it was this desert as desert gets. And during that time, we were challenged in a lot of ways. Uh, it was difficult, but all the while we maintained that God is faithful, that he who began to work in us would finish it. And in 2021, we started to see, as, as we've talked about in the past, this oasis, this end of the desert season. I didn't know what it looked like, but we saw it coming. And one of the cultivations of this change was the Lord calling us back here to Springfield. We were living in Columbus at the time. Um, so we were really excited. We, we didn't know what that looked like, but I, I was excited to come back home. And one of the, the word I got from the Lord during that time, and this is going to sound really interesting, the word I got from the Lord when we were, when we were moving back is bridge. And I'm sure you can tell why that's going to be important, but I still want to unpack it. So we came back, and when I got that word, I had my own idea of what the Lord was wanting to do with this word in my life. What I had the idea of, is it repairing relationships and bridging the gap with people that I had hurt or had hurt me? Was it repairing relationships with other people that had been hurt? Whatever, I had my own idea of what that looked like, and I, I pursued that for the first year we were back to, to no avail, no success which led me and my wife and some friends of ours to here. We, we were trying to find a place that we could put in roots and grow our family and, and be one and, and, and be with other believers and, and be a part of a church that wanted to see the kingdom come in Springfield. 
So that led us here. Uh, my wife was sold immediately. Um, it took me till January, and I'll, I'll tell you, and you'll see why. It wasn't anything with the church. I just didn't know. I, I had spent so much time trying to force what I felt the Lord was trying to do in my life. I wanted to know that what I was doing was what he actually wanted. So at the beginning of January, if you've been coming since then, you will remember Vision Sunday. And Vision Sunday was really powerful. When we came in December, this church was called the Northridge Vineyard. In January, we had Vision Sunday, which I was really excited about. And one of the most amazing things that came out of that was the name change of the church to the bridge. And that was the light flipped. And I realized, okay. And I finally felt for the first time in a very long time that I was in the place that the Lord wanted me to be. Not because I tried to conjure it up, but because he made it happen. So that brings me to where I am today. Um, I had met Dennis, uh, as he said, um, through Connect Group. He talked about Connect Groups. I encourage you, it's hard to put into words how valuable Connect Groups are. Sign up for one. Sign up for one. I went into it just really excited to, to grow in relationship with other people, step out of my comfort zone, and, you know, grow with people that aren't just my best friends. And out of that, I met Dennis, and I kind of developed a little bit of a mentor-mentee relationship with him that I hope will continue to grow. But we got to this place where I kind of was into the idea of, of preaching. And I didn't know what that would look like. I'd always kind of disqualify, disqualify myself. Uh, but we started that conversation, and that conversation led us to where I am right now. And I'm so excited to continue this series, the foundation of which comes from Romans 5.17. I think we have it to come up. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You've heard that. If you've been coming over the last couple of months, you've heard that. You've heard that verse a lot. And when, we, when I first found out that was a series we were going into, uh, over the summer, uh, I was really excited because grace is so foundational to how we approach our life, our walk with the Lord. Grace is the foundation. Some churches, you may have been a part of a church like this, I know I have, can tend to fall into this trap of preaching a, a mixed message. You may have experienced this. They, they will say grace is valuable, but grace is important, but you also have to do this. They start adding law. And you're, you're, it, well, the problem is when it becomes about your ability when, when, when your relationship with God becomes about what you can do, run away from this. Because it becomes a mixed message. It's no longer about grace. It's about grace, but also how good can you be? How much right can you do? And as soon as you do wrong, it falls apart. When grace is given as a price tag of anything other than the finished work of Christ, you pervert the gospel. I want to say that again. When grace is given a price tag of anything other than the finished work of Christ, you pervert the gospel. And that brings me to my title, Grace is Everything. Grace is Everything. Like I said, when you add law to grace, you, be cre you create a mixture. And this mixture leads to spiritual death. Spiritual death. In Galatians 5.4, and I'm realizing I actually forgot to give this one, so it won't be up there. But in Galatians 5.4, it kind of speaks to this. Paul says, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. So he speaks on grace. When you try to be justified by the law within the realms of that, you're severed from Christ. Because our salvation, our righteousness, our justification, and our freedom from the bondage of sin our reconciliation with God is only possible with grace. Not your own abilities, not your achieving, not your striving, but in grace. And you might be wondering, wh wh why, wh how, is this, how is this grace so free? How is it so readily available? Why free? And I want to read Romans 3, 23 through 25. It'll actually be the ESV up here. But in my study just this morning, I actually found a translation I like a little more that we didn't have access to. So, in Romans 3, 23 through 25, it says this, All have sinned and fall short of God's glory, but all are treated as righteous freely by his grace because of a ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus. Through his faithfulness, God displayed Jesus as the place of sacrifice where mercy is found by means of his blood. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness in passing over sins that happened before. Mixture of grace and law is a dangerous and spiritually deadly choice. When we mix grace with the law, we pervert the gospel, as I've said before. The law 
just to explain the law really quick, the law is, the sta- is this a standard that must be met perfectly to accomplish reconciliation with God. And to, to dive a little deeper into this, I want to compare two of the letters in the New Testament that Paul wrote to two groups of people. And to kind of give an idea for people that aren't super aware with the New Testament, it's, it's a compilation of, of books and letters written to different groups of people. One of the largest portions of the New, New Testament is Paul's letters. And he wrote one letter called the, the book of Galatians and one called Corinthians to the people of Corinth and to the people of Galatians. And in these two letters, um, we see a much different tone from Paul towards these places. In Galatians, we're going to see Paul have a very angry, frustrated tone as he speaks to them. And in, the, in Corinthians, we're going to see a, a more calm tone. And why is that? The why is very important. The why is very important. In Corinthians, at the, at both, both, chat, both letters begin with a, with a um, greeting, as most of his letters do, but the, it takes a turn after that. In 1 Corinthians 1.4, it says this. It says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. So we don't see any, any harsh words. We see, the, we see thankful. He's thankful to God for them. We see a little bit different words in Galatians. In Galatians 1, 6, and 7, Paul starts off by saying, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And if that doesn't convince you of his tone, a couple chapters later in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, he says this. And I'm not going to, I don't, cool. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And I could read the rest of that, but that, I think if that doesn't convince you, I'm not really sure what more I could do to convince you that his tone with the Galatians is much more firm and stern and a little bit of angry. Why the difference in tone? The question is why? Why do we see that? And it's interesting. You would think this difference of tone would mean that things were all really good in Corinth and with the Corinthians and things were not great with Galatians. But we actually see something a little different. When you read through that, his letter to the Corinthians, it is, we find out that the Corinthians are riddled with sin. They have, they have all kinds of sexual, sexual immorality, actually to the point, Paul says, that pagans wouldn't even tolerate. We find that they have massive divisions amongst each other. They're suing each other in the courts. They're not doing communion, right? There's this list of things that we see that they're, it's not going great as far as their behavior and their actions in Corinth. Yet his tone is still calm with them. And why? I, I want to start to unpack that in 1 Corinthians 15:1. It says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the, gospels, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. We see here the, the difference between the people in, in Corinth and the people in Galatia. The people in Galatia were actively involved in mixture. It says they were turning to a different gospel that Paul, pre, Paul had preached to them. They were adding law to grace. Whereas the Corinthians, even amidst all of their problems, they did not pervert the gospel. It says, you received this gospel in which you stand. That's the difference. And I want to make something very clear, because I don't want you to hear something I'm not saying. Paul did not condone their behavior and their sin. Don't think I'm saying, go sin, it's fine, because grace. That's not what I'm saying. Paul did not validate or condone their behavior. But they had hope because they weren't perverting the gospel. They had hope because they weren't perverting the gospel. They weren't trying to do things on their own. Both had sin, but the Galatians were spiritually dead because they were attempting to accomplish freedom by turning back to the law. The Corinthians held true to the gospel of grace, and they were able to receive correction and guidance that the Galatians were not able to receive. And we see that throughout the whole chapter. And this illustrates my point again. I want to say it again because it's so important. Grace is everything. Grace is everything. As I was reflecting on what I wanted to talk about, I, I, I like to get personal about things, and I, I wasn't sure I have a cool story to tell to kind of bring this to home, but then I was reminded of a time in my early 20s. I had been walking with the Lord for a few years at that point, and um, I entered this weird season where I actually fell victim to this, this, uh, this idea of, of mixture. I was striving. I, was, I started to think, I started to feel not right with God. And I can't say if it was a message I heard at the time or if it was, I can't speak to why I was feeling this way, but I started thinking I have to do. I need to cut things out of my life. I, I had stopped listening to any music other than Christian, which don't, I'm not saying shouldn't do that, but 
my, my motive was wrong. But I was doing that. I, I got rid of my cell phone. I was alienating myself from anyone. I, I, I was just going down this path of trying to figure out how can I make myself right with God? And I remember I was having this really holy moment in the house that I was living in where I was praying. And I was like, Lord, what else can I do? What, what do you want me to do? What can I give up to be right with you? And it was so powerful. I remember I, I've, I've heard the Lord speak to me several times. And I can't really put the words what he's about to say, what he says to me in this, in this story. But the, the gist of what I heard from him after I asked him this question of what can I do, basically the gist I heard from him was why? Why are you asking me this? And I was immediately wrecked with this revelation of I had, as we, I left my first love. I had forgotten that grace is a solution to all of my problems, not my doing, not my adherence to this perfect standard of the law. And I was, I just remember just crying, just laying there. I was so I was frustrated with myself, but I was also relieved of, I had been trying so hard and I was reminded of that grace is the answer, not my doing. And I actually had a moment similar to that like five-ish minutes ago. I was sitting here and while Lindsay was talking, it, it, I was reflecting and I was praying kind of within myself and, and I immediately was overcome with, with this grace and this joy. And it was because through this preparation, I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty, we're all busy, but I'm, I'm a pretty busy guy. And when I do something, um, I want to do it right. I don't want to half, um, you know what I want to say, right? I don't want to half, I don't want, I don't want to halfway do something. In the words of Dennis, I'm not, you guys can think and I'm not going to say it. So I like to put a lot of effort and work into what I'm doing. And it, it can play to my advantage, but it can also be a detriment because sometimes I will overdo it and end up actually being in a worse place than I was before. And leading up to this, um, my schedule made it really difficult to pour into this the way I wanted to. So I've really been getting after it. And I was really excited for this opportunity, but I was so stressed about it because I wanted to deliver. I wanted to really, this grace thing is so important to me. I wanted to get the words across in such a way that people were impacted. And I was trying so hard. And even in, so I'm sitting here and all of a sudden I'm just overwhelmed. I start to tear up a little bit, which I try to fight it because I'm a man. Men don't cry, right? So I'm fighting it and I had this moment, I was like, okay, Lord, like, and it was said to me earlier this morning, this is not my morning, this is his. And I was encouraged by that, that was that moment. And that's the point I'm trying to get across, that in moments when you feel like you wanna add mixture, you're tempted to try to add to the gospel of Christ and pervert it, remember what got you here. Remember it's grace that does it. Grace is everything. So in, in Revelation, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into this really quick, in, in Revelation, 3, 15, and 16, it's a letter that, from Jesus to the church in Laodicea. And I want to kind of break this, this passage down. So in Revelation 3, 15, and 16, it says this, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And as I was diving into this, I can remember when I first read this scripture in my, in my early 20s, um, I can remember interpreting this through the lens of culturally what we look at as hot and cold, right? If you're hot, you're on fire. You're doing everything you're supposed to do. You are, you're reading your Bible every day. You're worshiping consistently. You're, you're really getting after it. And if you were cold, it's the exact opposite. You weren't doing any of those things. And this, then lukewarm fell, fell somewhere in the middle. I think the term that I always thought of was like on the fence, right? And I don't think I'm alone in that. I've heard it preached this way, that this is what Jesus was talking about in the context of the scripture. But I actually think there's a better way to look at this. I actually, when I was researching the scripture, there's multiple ways that people have looked at this, um, but I tend to like my way because I, li I like it my way. <laughs> so, so let's look at it, let's look at it this way. Let's look at it as if hot is grace, cold is the law. What does that make lukewarm? What would you say? Mixture, right? Mixture becomes the lukewarm. Mixture of law and grace, this perversion of the gospel is lukewarm. Why is being cold then? So we can, we can see why hot would be better, right? Hot was grace. So obviously grace is better than being lukewarm. Why is the law better? And I wanna, before I dive into this, I wanna make something else clear. I wanna make it very clear that I'm not encouraging you to turn to the law. That's not what I'm doing here. In this, in this context, Jesus is saying, if you're already under the law, that's better than being lukewarm because there's hope for you. And I want, to, I want to show you that hope in Romans 5, 20 and 21. It says this. It says, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The law came in to increase sin, 
But where the sin increased, grace abounded all the more, leading us to reigning through righteousness in Christ. This is why cold in this, in this context is better than lukewarm, because when, when you're lukewarm, you're confused. There's no confidence. There's no boldness. You're mixing things up. You don't, you're, you're still kind of on the fence, but in the context of you're not confident in who you are. When you're hot, you are. When you're cold, you will eventually be hot because of the purpose of the law is to bring forth righteousness through grace. Mixture is not God's heart. Grace is God's heart. Mixture is not God's heart. Grace is God's heart. And to help internalize this and to bring it home, I want to ask a few questions. And when I ask the questions, there's a purpose, and I'll get to it, but I also want you to think about your answer and be honest. I'm not asking you to search yourself uh, and figure out the sin in your life. I'm just asking you to answer this question as it pertains to you. Does the gospel that you believe lead you to boldness and confidence as sons and daughters of God? Does it? Does the gospel you believe lead you to boldness and confidence? Does the gospel you believe lead you to freedom and joy? Does the gospel you believe lead to freedom and joy? Or, and, are you reigning in grace? Does the gospel you believe lead you to reigning in grace? Or, does the gospel you believe cause you to feel guilt and shame? Does the gospel you believe cause you to feel condemnation? And does the gospel you believe actually drain you of confidence and boldness as a son or a daughter of God? Friends, I'm here to tell you we are called to boldness and confidence. As Dennis said, he, he didn't steal my thunder because it's so important to say it as many times as we possibly can. We are called to freedom and joy. We're called to reign. We're called to these things. And I, I don't want you to just take my word for it. I'm going to read some scripture that kind of backs me up here. So we talked about boldness, right? So in Hebrews 4, 16, we'll start there. Therefore, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Confidence. Confidence. In 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Boldness. Should, mm, yeah, bold, okay. Yep, 1 John. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Confidence. Boldness. Confidence. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. I talked about we're called to be sons and daughters. Do you believe me now? Galatians 5.1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Again, I say, we are called to boldness and confidence. We are called to freedom and joy we are called to reign. This morning, uh, Wes shared a funny story about a, for a fortune cookie he got recently. And it, it wasn't even something I was even thinking would come up today. And thankfully, the Lord has his own plans. Um, I also have a funny fortune cookie story that just happened yesterday. And it fits really perfectly with this. So I, like Dennis said, I'm a firefighter. So when we're at the firehouse, our day that we're on, we, um, somebody cooks. Yesterday, no one felt like cooking lunch. So we decided to go out for lunch and then cook dinner. So only one meal. So we decided on Chinese. So we go and get Chinese and uh, we get back to the firehouse and we're eating. And I open up my fortune cookie, not because I really care all that much about what fortune cookies say. I just always think it's fun to see what, what nonsense they come up with. But unfortunately, or fortunately, there was actually some, some good truth to what I read. So I open up, and it's going to be funny in the context of me as a firefighter. So I open up the fortune cookie and I unravel it. And it says, set yourself on fire. Set yourself on fire for something that matters, and everybody from all around will come to watch you burn. <laughs> yeah, set yourself on fire for something that matters, and people from all around will come to watch you burn, and I'm on fire for grace. And I want to set you on fire for the same thing. Be on fire for grace. And I know it sounds funny as a firefighter wanting to set something on fire. I'm sure there's a truth in there somewhere. But this is so valuable, this is so important, this is why I was so excited as we were getting into this series because I think it's so foundational to Christian culture in the West of abandoning your own self-efforts and ability and realizing that your identity, who you are, is found in Christ, not in your own doing. You're not able to do it on your own. 
And again, I want to read Romans 5, 17. It says, For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You reign in life by recognizing that grace is your enabler, not the law. Grace is what enables you to live free and to reign, not your own abilities. Embrace the gospel of Christ. If you, uh, if you need prayer, uh, I would encourage you to come up as we, as we wrap up here. There will be people up here that will be able to pray for you as we enter worship. Um, if you want to get out of your seat and dance and, and have a good time, do that. Uh, be free to enjoy the goodness. Be on fire for this grace. It's so important to be on fire for this grace because it's what enables you to reign in life. And I just want to pray as the worship team comes out. I don't think I did a good enough job of signal, signaling them. Um, so they're on their way out. But I just want to pray and I want to encourage you to, to be on fire for this. And, and I'll, I'll tell you one of the best ways to do this is to be around other people that are on fire. If you set something on fire and something gets close enough to it, that thing's going to also be on fire. And there's a lot of people in this church that are really on fire about grace. And if you're struggling with that, everybody that's standing up here in the front is also on fire for grace and they will help set you on fire. I'll set you on fire. <laughs> But there's such a key to being set on fire in grace because everything else flows from that. And so I just want to pray and then we'll worship and, uh, and just have a good time. And, and Jesus, I just thank you for this time. I just thank you for this church. And I thank you for the heart that this church has for your kingdom here in Springfield. That our foundation of our relationship with you rests in grace, not in our own abilities. Not in our own ability to be perfect, but in Christ's ability to be perfect. God, thank you so much for what you're doing. And I just thank you for this people, and I, I pray you would open their hearts and set it on fire. Set it on fire for grace and remind them throughout their lives that in moments when they're tempted to, to complete this work on their own, that they would be reminded that it's already completed, that you already did the work. You already accomplished what we were not able to. And we're able to reign in grace in this life because of grace. Grace is everything. Remind us in our moments when we don't understand things that grace is everything. Remind us when we're sad or lonely or we don't know who we are, that you say who we are and that grace is our identity in you. I thank you, Jesus, for this time of worship. I pray for the worship team that, that they would just cultivate this, this, this heart of worship and that people would be brought into a place to be set on fire. And I thank you, and I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.